Hello and welcome to Back of the Net and Beyond, where today I'm going to be speaking to former Singaporean professional footballer, R. Sasi Kumar. How are you doing? You okay? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. And how are you? Yeah, I'm all good, thanks. Um, trying to get back to normality. Obviously, you're aware of the pandemic and um, what's going on uh, along, along kind of uh, across the world, basically. Um, and everyone's been affected kind of uh, differently across the board. And to be honest, I used it as an opportunity to obviously spend more time with the family, but uh, not only that, to start a podcast as well. So in theory, mm. the lockdown kind of it worked out for me. I'm back at work now for the last two weeks or so. So yeah, just trying to get to uh, normality in inverted commas. Uh, how's life treating you at the moment? Um, like you, I say, I really appreciate uh, the time that I spent with the kids and the family because as you, as you know, um, being and running a business and uh, being involved um, in my life as an entrepreneur. Mm. Right, because we're meeting, we're running around and doing a lot of stuff. Sometimes we, you know, don't stop and actually think about the people that need us most, which mm. are the, well, the kids, right? The kids don't really um, need anything from you. Uh, they just need love. What does love mean? It means actually yeah. it's time, right? They need time with you. Yeah. Um, so, so I've got two boys, nine and seven. So, uh, this whole, the last 90 days have been quite interesting in the sense that we spend more time. We spend more time doing things, learning things, being together. And also, because the whole world came to a grinding halt, it gave yeah. me a time, you know, of, you know, some time to pursue the things that I've always wanted to do. You know, okay. you, know you have that to-do list, right? And you never get around to doing it. Yeah. Um, and and on, perversely, I mean, what happened with this whole pandemic, is, it's quite bad, but... Um, in terms of pushing the reset button and trying to recalibrate what you're doing was perfect. Brilliant. Um, and if you want to just let people know, obviously, what you're doing now. So obviously, you used to play football and then you've obviously um, transitioned into something else. So just let everyone know what you're doing currently. Um, I, <laughs> I'll try to keep it as, as brief as possible. I do quite a lot, right? So uh, like you said, I was a professional footballer. I quit very early. I finished at 29. Uh, pursued a sports marketing career. I was in Australia for a year, came back, started my own agency and uh, scaled it from being a one-man show to 60 people in five different markets. Wow. Uh, at some point, I was doing 50 trips a year, which was <laughs> nothing to be proud of, but it happened. And uh, <laughs> that's what I, I, was, I was doing. Yeah. 2016, I actually exited the business. Um, I had uh, someone, a big Japanese conglomerate, uh, come in and say they want to get 25% of the business and eventually over three years buy me out fully. Um, the second year, they kind of exited that business because they got a management takeover. So they actually gave me back the money. Oh, sorry. They gave me back the company, gave me the bunch of money and I, that was like winning the lottery, which was kind of good. Uh, <laughs> but along with acquisition comes a lot of issues because we expanded really uh, quickly, took on a lot more stuff. So I had to resize, recalibrate. Didn't enjoy what I was doing because that was already about 13 years into what I was doing. Didn't really enjoy the 50 trips a year and stuff like that. So I took that moment to say, can we pivot into something else? So pivoted into being a consultancy. Then slowly went into um, packaging what I've known and learned over the last 13 years and helping athletes out. So I, was, uh, I had a couple of, I started a program called Sports Business Mentor and okay. reached started organic, organically reaching out to a lot of athletes. I actually started in England, in the UK, with lower division players um, wow. who are notorious for not really planning the future. Yeah. And, and took on a few uh, students, gave them some results, and subsequently also did a pilot project with the PFA. I was in London last August. We did okay. a pilot project with, uh, with a couple of boys there. Uh, yeah. Two out of the four got really good results. Um, then I continue doing it. These days I have a, a full-fledged program that I run and right. I do mentorship. I've got my own media company. I do, like you, I, I have a, a Facebook live show. I am also have my own radio show here in Singapore with one of the largest broadcasters on the weekend. Yeah. Uh, I keep myself busy. I, I'm also doing mergers and acquisitions of different small businesses. So, um, I don't try, to, you know, I'm, I'm still young and I've still got the energy, so I'm going full on. Yeah, I don't blame you. It sounds like you're doing a lot there. And obviously, it must feel like you're giving back to the football community um, on a wider scale. Because obviously, you're not just working, is it Singapore that you're based at the moment? Yes, I'm based in Singapore, yeah. yeah. So it's not just over there. You're obviously uh, reaching out to people in the UK and obviously various parts of the world. So that must be massive. And like I said, it sounds like you're doing a lot of things, which you are. How do you cram that into your average week? 
Um, I would say that one of the things that I've learned over time, it's time management, right? Uh, if you yeah. don't have a clear plan on where you want to go and what you want to do, mm. then time is never enough, right? So we've got 24 hours of which we want to sleep uh, at least eight, eight hours. We want to uh, laze around for another hour. We want yeah. to have lunch and dinner and all of that stuff. So I wake up pretty early every day. My day starts quite early, um, 5.30, 6 o'clock sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but most days I, I get up early. I do things when everybody's asleep so that I get a bulk of the things done. So I got no distractions. So I do a lot of the heavy lifting in the morning uh, to make yeah. sure that the, the actual physical work, the mental thinking of the uh, side of the work that I need to do, I get it done. I've got virtual assistants all over the world. Um, this is the new way to work. I hire uh, people that really... Um, need the money in maybe say low cost markets, uh, I pay them quite well. So they organize things for me so that I, I look at my time as what's the best output I can give uh, yeah. per hour, right? So if there's stuff that I can actually outsource and gain that hour to do something a bit more high value, that's what I do. So I have an army of people around me that uh, I, I try and, 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 and employ. I try and make sure that they do a bit of the heavy lifting for me so that I just left to do the strategic thinking yeah. and, and connecting the dots in terms of uh, meeting with people, the relationship building. So you don't really need to be sending the emails out. You don't need to be putting the proposals together. You don't need to be editing the, the videos and stuff like that. You don't need it. You can actually outsource the entire stuff, right? And I think people get caught up with the fact that they don't want to spend money. They don't want to yeah. outsource. Um, so I, I approach it that way. And that's the reason why it feels as though I'm doing a lot of stuff, but at the same time, I, I can try and balance things. Yeah, there are days where I feel overwhelmed. Uh, I'm, I'm only human. Mm -hmm. And I sort of start step back and say, where have I messed up? So I've got uh, several diaries on my, on my table here now where mm -hmm. I keep uh, you know, very strict uh, timelines. Except for the weekend, I'm a little bit, uh, I would say, relaxed. And that's yeah. the time that I completely unwind. So I do... Sometimes I do, do some mindless, mindless things, you know, um, just absolutely do not, nothing. Uh, that's just to let the brain rest and, and relax. And then, you know, tomorrow, the day starts really early for me tomorrow. Wow. I mean, um, something that you mentioned there in terms of like delegating, uh, delegating jobs to other people so that you can use that time more sufficiently for yourself. Um, I've kind of been researching a few entrepreneurs, you being one of them. And a lot of the things that they mention is not being afraid to delegate. Um, if you've got an hour where you could be spending maybe networking with someone else or having a meeting or doing something um, to obviously enhance your profile, uh, obviously increase your business presence, um, maybe delegate that time to someone, someone else and, and essentially hire that person and don't be afraid to spend the money doing, um, doing that as well. I mean, I'm not, I'm not on that level. Um, that's a different capacity, but um, again, it's just it's. I like to get an insight from as many different people as possible, just to give me more of a broader scope in terms of how people work. And obviously, you're doing what you're doing, and that's it's really commendable. Obviously, I, I look up to people like yourself because there's a lot to learn. And for me, um, especially as an ex sports person, uh, or in life in general, in general, kind of, I always ask questions. Um, I'm not afraid to ask. And again, it's something that I resonate by uh, in terms of. I always say, look, if you don't ask, the answer is always going to be no. Um, mm. So what you're saying there, I've heard that many times. So it must be true. And obviously, if it's coming from someone commendable like yourself, then um, it, it's kind of foolproof, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, you know, a lot of people spend too much time thinking about um, not spending money is one. Secondly, it's like, oh, I can't outsource this because I'm the only guy who knows how to do this. Mm. Um, and I'm... I'm, I, I'm a living proof of that because I had that problem. I had that issue. Right. So I was the bottleneck of success. I was my own yeah. bottleneck. So days where I felt that nah, nobody else can do this better than me, then I realized that it doesn't have to be 100% of me. Yeah. If I can put framework systems in place and guide people, a lot of the time when you delegate, delegate some to, to work to people, why they fail is because you don't give them clear instructions. You don't give yeah. them clear parameters. If you, don't, you don't give them clear outcomes that you expect. You mm -hmm. don't draw the expectations. So these days, what I do is that even if I'm hiring a freelance or anyone, I make sure that I outline the outcome very clearly. Yeah. And I, I make sure that that person understands it and commits to it. 
And okay. if the person feels like, uh, no, or if I'm not sure the person is actually 100% committed, we don't go into that arrangement. Mm. It saves us a lot, of, a lot of trouble and obviously saves us a lot of uh, time and effort and of course not to save money, right? Yeah. So I, be I believe it, that's the way to approach it. Uh, like you're saying, you know, you learn from different people. I do the same, right? Success leaves clues. You look at those people who've been highly successful. If you look at somebody like Sir Richard Branson in the UK, I mean, he, how many businesses does Virgin have? Like over a thousand businesses. Like yeah. how is it humanly possible for someone to do that? So obviously he must be doing something right. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that he, everything he does is right, but mm -hmm. you pick the good parts and then you leave the bad parts, right? So like I said, success leaves clues and our job, is to pick up those clues and piece it and make sure that it fits our lifestyle because uh, one size doesn't fit all. I mean, you have different needs and you're a different guy and same, at, you know, likewise, I have different things, different way of thinking. So what we, but one common thing is that we all are in the business of success, mm. right? We all are in the business of success. So we all want success. We all want the best things for our families and ourselves. So then what does that leave us to do? So go out there, look for somebody that resonates with you and that's one of the reasons why even the most successful people I know don't put out enough content because they're afraid of what other people will actually say, yeah. right? They'll say, oh, what's he saying? Like, I'm, I'm not the most successful guy on earth. I'm by mm -hmm. far from that, right? But I share a lot of stuff because I know someone maybe like you will resonate with it. I get, I, get, uh, I will say, tens of emails, uh, LinkedIn messages of yeah. all the stuff that I share people telling me that, you know, you inspired me to do something, your, your video resonated with me, what you told me is really well. Mm -hmm. So my oxygen is that, like that's my oxygen. So I yeah. don't really care about, yeah, there are people that will just look and say, oh, what's he on about, right? That's fine with me, you yeah. know. Um, you know, that's a, that's a great saying, right? If you don't have haters, you're not right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I kind of I live by that rule and, uh, you know, um, our job, uh, no matter what you do in life, no matter how little, is to inspire the next person next to you. So if you can do that, then I think then that's a life worth leading. Absolutely. I agree with everything you just said there. I mean, I, I can relate to it um, to a certain degree. I mean, two things there that you kind of touched on indirectly was networking. Obviously, I wasn't aware of who you were um, until I kind of went on LinkedIn and obviously um, Instagram as well. And that's generally how, aside from personally knowing people within the football fraternity. If I don't know them and I get them on the show, generally it's either word of mouth or I do a bit of research to find them. Um, and that's massive. Um, like I said, I'm not afraid to ask. If people say no, that's fine. They've got their own kind of yeah. genders. Um, so I always say, look, for, for every person I get on the show, there's 20, 30, maybe more people that I haven't had a response from yet. Um, mm. Very rarely people don't really say no anyway but sometimes they just won't get back to you, which is sometimes worse. But people are really busy, um, especially high-profile mm -hmm. people like yourself. They're really, really busy, which is why I'm kind of really thankful that you came on the show because it gets me, it gives me an opportunity to pick your brains. And whilst I'm doing that, it gives us an opportunity for the listeners to understand kind of someone who's been a footballer, been a successful one of that, and then obviously has gone into the other side of business. Um, and obviously you're doing a lot within that um, framework. Um, in terms of kind of um, your transition from football, how did you find that? Uh, Danny, I'll be honest, because I was forced out of the game. Like that was, uh, I believe it was 2003. Um, in 2002, I, mm -hmm. I went on trial uh, to France, right? I tried my luck in France. I went to France. I went to a second division club called Wascal. There's an agent that said that, you know, you're good enough to play in the second division in France. I'll take you there. I went there. To be honest, I did quite well. Um, when I was 19, I actually went to Holland, to Herenveen. I wasn't ready. Um, and, and obviously, they didn't give me a contract. But I've always wanted to play in Europe. I always wanted to test myself at a higher level. Mm. And went back to France in the second division with Pascal. Unfortunately, some problems and issues with the agent, which we all have experienced at some point in life. And in our careers, we have experienced that and it didn't materialize. So when I came back um, um, with my profile and as being an ex-professional uh, national team player at the time, all the senior contracts were all taken up because our league is quite a small league, right? So the yeah. big contracts were all, all taken up. And I was only left with an option of playing part-time, like semi-professional. Yeah. So what I did was instead of saying no, and I was at the prime of my career, right? I Two things could happen, I actually quit or 
pick up the contract uh, um, uh, part-time, mm-hmm. work myself up and you know, try and make sure that I prove that I deserve a contract. So I went okay. to join a club called Jurong FC in, in, um, in Singapore. Um, and, the, and the coach was a former national player, very famous player. So he said he'll take a chance with me. He made me the captain. Because I was, the, I was coming into a lower team. I always played for championship winning teams. And before that, I've won a lot of championships locally and internationally. So they yeah. made me captain. I actually led the team um, to, the, to the cup final that year. Wow. right? And, and out, out of 30, probably played the most number of games that season. Out of 33 games a season, I played 32 games. Wow. Injury free, I just got suspended one. So had a wonderful season. I, had, I was really at the top of my game. And then what happened was another club came in, the, the team that we played in the cup finals, we lost in the cup final. That yeah. team that we played against, the next day they called me and said, we want to we wanna, we wanna sign you out. So okay. I signed for the biggest contract of my career. So I went from part-time football to signing mm-hmm. one of the biggest contracts ever, right, in my career. And it was a two-year contract. Started, um, signed as a centre-back, went there. The coach wanted to replace um, a couple of the CDM players there and wanted to make me the captain. Obviously, as you know, players, you know, uh, professional jealousy and stuff like that. So all of that going into play. The coach got sacked halfway through the season, even though we were leading the table. There's a fallout with the with the chairman. I was being played out of position. I was played in a defensive midfield role, uh, that's which is not my role. But I still did well. Scored two goals, gave the club six points uh, on the mm-hmm. table. I, I, I just did my job. New guy came in, didn't fancy me because he wanted to be with the other side. And then made, made it really hard for me. Put me on the bench for, for 14 matches consecutively. So 14 matches, I was on the bench. Made me train with the reserves. I did everything I could just to stay yeah. professional because I knew I had a two-year contract. At the end of the season, that coach, that coach got sacked. The management came to me and said, well, we've got to cancel your contract. So I'm like, no, I've got a two-year deal. You've got to pay me out. So And then you know, went back and forth, back, back and forth. Um, eventually, they paid me out. I... I, I Stop playing. I was disillusioned at that time, as we all you know, tend to do when we are young and a little bit hot-headed, maybe. Um, so I got out of the game. I said, okay, this is enough. But I missed the game. I was only 29. I know I, I got a lot more to offer. Yeah. Um, and, and what I did was I started getting back into working. I was working slowly. And then I was also coaching. I was a player manager in one level be- below um, mm-hmm. in, in the semi-professional league. Didn't enjoy the coaching part of it because I still was a player. Mm-hmm. Um, and thankfully, you know, halfway through the, the season, there was a transfer window. Um, I wanted to end my career on my terms, yeah. right? I, wanted, I didn't want to do that. So I spoke to uh, um, my previous club. There was an English manager called uh, Steve Darby, top guy. He said, I understand exactly what you're going through. Come and play for my team, right? So he wow. was a top guy and allowed me to do what I wanted to do, finish my career on my terms. So... Right at the end, when I was finishing at 29, I had an opportunity to go overseas. I had an offer from uh, an agency in Australia mm-hmm. um, to go there and do sports marketing. I jumped at it. Uh, it was just two weeks after I got married. So I left for a honeymoon on my own, which was <laughs> not the best thing to do. Uh, my wife was running her own uh, family business here, so she couldn't come with me. I had a great experience. Melbourne is uh, one of the biggest sporting cities in the world. Uh, mm-hmm. Such a great place to live, as you know. Probably might have been there or heard of Australia. What a beautiful place. Mm-hmm. Uh, really good people, nice people, nice weather and everything. I love everything about Australia. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, I had to come back. I had to come back. I'll tell you, the transition wasn't easy. Coming back to your point, uh, the transition wasn't easy. Not many people actually know. I was really depressed for about six months. That period where I went back to finish, I was so depressed. I didn't want to speak to anyone. I didn't, I, I kind of, didn't have that self-worth anymore, mm. right? I didn't have that belief anymore. Like, I was a nobody. Like, take football away from me I, and I'm just another guy on the street, right? Mm. And, and watching your mates playing week in, week out, knowing that they're going to have good banter in the, in the dressing room and they're going to be going out after for a drink, the, the euphoria of winning and the, you know, the downs of losing, that's yeah. been ripped away from you. Like, that's all you knew for a long time. Mm. So, I, I kind of saw a very different side of me but I, I mean I, I wasn't depressed in a way that it was was bad bad but it was it was still a tough time for me really tough time didn't know what I wanted to do worried of obviously about income like what's going to happen next mm. uh, I had a bit of education behind me I, I knew that if I really wanted to do something I could I could you know make a living it's, and I was never afraid of that uh, it's just that it was the purpose what was my purpose in life now yeah like what would I do um, but the good thing is that I got involved with a lot of the, the TV punditry, punditry stuff. I, I was on TV, 
and stuff like that. So I started enjoying my life. What I did was I put away everything that reminded me of football. Everything. Like mm. uh, I packed everything in. I started dressing differently uh, because I wanted to be known as an entrepreneur, as a professional now, not uh, the footballer. Yeah. Because you and I know, you know, footballers will get, I suppose, this um, preconceived notion that we are just footballers, right? Yeah. Right? Mm. Uh, what do you really know, right? Um, but to play football at a decent level, you've got to be smart. You know, it's, yes. it's not, uh, you, people don't understand how fast you've got to think yeah. on your feet to make decisions, move here. And cool thinking. With, with, with no disrespect, stupid people can't think like that. Yeah. Right. So, uh, but but the problem is, perhaps our off the field activities don't really do us justice, right? Uh, you and I know this uh, for a fact that during our playing days, we probably took it a little bit more easier than most. Uh, <laughs> enjoy life a bit more, which is fine when you're young and you know if you're earning a bit of cash and you want to live the life, that's all good and fine. But you find that sometimes when you get into the real professional world, that becomes your detriment. Mm, definitely. I mean. You mentioned a few things there that kind of um, have popped up in previous podcasts that I've done with uh, other guests that I've had on the show. And uh, one of them was kind of losing your uh, identity to a certain degree. Um, I mean, I always draw on my experience because, again, mine was pretty seamless. Um, I mean, I didn't, I was just lucky because I didn't really have a plan. So for me, when I was offered a position in, um, in an estate agent, uh, which is a viable kind of um, a job to have, I was just relieved. I was relieved that I'd actually gone through the process, uh, had one interview, had a second interview with the same company, and then got offered the job. So I never really experienced that rejection. And it's not like I had a plan. I didn't have a foresight what I wanted to do. I always thought, well, I'm going to have to work because financially I haven't made enough money to maybe set up my own business or, or just relax and not do anything. So I always had that mindset from the age of 24, 25. I've said it many times before that I'd probably have to work. So that helped me going forward. Um, but at the same time, probably because I found a job which is uh, kind of financially sound to a certain degree, um, viable, uh, respectable, and I didn't experience that rejection. If I, if I had got rejected and then maybe went for a third and fourth and fifth interview elsewhere and not got that job as well, who knows where I'd be, if that makes sense. So for me, I was really, really lucky. Uh, I know it's not, it's not the same for everyone. I, to be honest, again, another side of the podcast is I don't want everyone's story to be the same as mine. I want people yeah. to understand that people can go through different experiences, um, have highs, have lows, make mistakes, make errors, whatever it may be, but then still find uh, their goal at the end of it. Um, because sometimes I think that athletes in general, they get sucked into being in that lifestyle, in that bubble, um, and then they use that as their identity. So they're, they're seen as a sports person first and then them second. Um, and I think that's, I think it's wrong. I think it should be the other way around. And in some ways you can't help what people's perception is of yourself, but you can help yourself um, from a mental and well-being perspective. And if you see yourself as yourself first and then an athlete second, I think going forward that, that helps you when it comes to making that transition because a lot of people are scared to make the leap for fear of what other people are thinking. Um, does that make sense to you? Yeah, no, but I want to tell you something also that's really important that we also don't forget that our identity as a footballer. I'll take my own experience, right? So when I got into the sports marketing game, <clears throat> the entire industry was just limited to European companies, uh, US companies, and some yeah. major uh, like Japanese companies. Mm. When I started a local agency, these guys were all looking at me and going like, you know, what's this guy doing, right? Coming into a space where he doesn't belong. But I also realized that it was also my strength. Because none of these guys actually played the game at a very high level. They had some one or two of the executives actually. But nobody actually understood that side of the game. I did. Uh, but my job was to now learn the other side of the game, which is the business side of it. And I said, if I can marry this both together, I've got a serious superpower here that not many have. Yep. Right? I can walk into that boardroom and say, um, Mr. Client or Miss Client or Mrs. Client, I've played, I've been on this side. I empathize with the athletes. I know what athletes are doing, what they are going through. And at this side, I say, I can marry those emotions together with your brand. And, and I, 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 spend, I spin a different narrative, right? So mm -hmm. that became my superpower. So I kind of doubled down on that, not to say that I wanted to completely forget my identity because you're not going to run away from it. They know who you are, 
uh, you are in the, you know, just have to Google and they know who you are. So, but what I did was I kind of try and extract that superpower and then created a, uh, I would say a, a, a new identity, right? If you look at my, if you look at my uh, Twitter handle and my Instagram handle, it's called Blade of God. People wonder what's Blade of God, but it's the moniker that the media here gave me after I scored the most important goal uh, for the country. So what I've done is that I've, ext I've extracted that, like I've taken the good part of that mm -hmm. and being a marketing guy and say, let me build this persona around it and then top of mind recall. And, and that's what I have become. So everyone knows, like everybody talks and they all go like, oh, the blade of God, the blade of God, which is fine. I, I own the domain, right? <laughs> I own the Twitter handle. I own the Instagram handle. Somebody has already done the heavy lifting for me. Now I just need to ride the wave, right? Yeah. So I think footballers, we have to look at it that way. Like, of course, we spend time, we sacrifice. Uh, many might say it's not a sacrifice you're paid, but still, you, there's an amount of sacrifice athletes go through, right? Yeah. Uh, but how do we harness the good things? I'll give you another example. One of my students in the UK, uh, you might have heard of his name. His name is Paul Bignett. He plays in the lower divisions now. He yeah, played yeah. In, in various divisions. Yeah, Paul's my student. He's been a student for a year. When I first started working with him, he was fresh. He had a small uh, video editing business. And when I asked him, he had some very limited beliefs about how he can actually extend his business. Okay. Fast forward, fast forward, one year now. During this whole pandemic, you know, the lower leagues, they're not paying anyone. He was making more money doing his business than actually being playing play football. And this wouldn't be possible when I was talking to him a year ago. He like, no, I still need to be in football. Today's mind is completely changed. He's realized that he needs to exit now. Like his business is taking. So we are actually working with him to say, how can he actually take it to the next level? We are looking at, you know, um, buying a business. Now, how can we actually buy a business? And, and you know, in the UK market, uh, 60, 70% of the, of the business owners are all baby boomers, meaning to say they are past 60 years old. They don't yeah. have succession plans. They want to, they want to, they actually are motivated sellers. They want to get out of the business. Right. Like someone like someone like a Paul would be primed to take over some business for a, a pound. Like if you structure it properly, you can yeah. take over the business for a pound. So these are the kind of work we do. And that's what I mean, coming back to the point of, you know, identity, like because it's easy for whoever you're going up and talking to them, say, I'm a footballer. They can Google you and say, that's a level of trust already. Mm -hmm. Now, now what you need to do is increase your level of credibility, making sure you have the substance to back it up. Wow. And then, so you obviously, I'm going to touch on your businesses a bit later on with more detail. So I wanted to go more in depth and let people know what you're actually doing. Um, but you mentioned there kind of Paul Bignett. Um, I do, I remember playing against him a couple of times. I think he was a right back from what I can remember. Yeah, he's a right back, yeah. Yeah. So, and I think he's a bit older than me. I'm 39. I think he may be slightly older than me. But what did you do to help his business then? Um, and just what, what is his business? So, so, you know, one of the things that I, I, when I started to do is over, over the last, I would say what, 15 years where have I been, when I've been an entrepreneur, I realized that when you start a business, you are, you are guessing, mm. right? You don't have all the answers. You're guessing. Yeah. So it's like you sitting in your car now and trying to get to the, the city center, wherever you live in a, your, let's say if you're in London, you're trying to get, so would you rather be just driving around and finding your way to get to the city center or someone sit next to you and say, turn left, turn right, turn right, and then get there faster? Because I know what's a, what I would like, right? Yeah, so that's exactly, that's exactly what I do with my mentorship program, okay. right? Uh, even though now I've become a bit more narrow in exactly who I help uh, because I want to uh, reach a larger group. But when I started, I was really helping them to, to first fix their mental capacity, mm -hmm. right? A lot of people start with no end in mind. Like you don't, so you need to reverse engineer where you want to go. Yeah. In including myself, I was chasing my tail for five years in my business. I didn't know what I was doing. Like okay. what the hell I was doing. I'll be completely honest. I had no clue what I was doing in business for five years. That's a long time. Yeah, yeah. But I, but I persevered. I made sure that um, I stayed the course because that's the person I am. That's how I played football because mm -hmm. I never gave up. I was one of those guys who never had talent, but I had this. I had the determination okay. to keep going. Yeah. And that's how I reached the apex of my, of my career, being an international player. So I said, if I can stick to something, and two things will happen. Either the business will break or I'll break. 
So, <laughs> right. So I, I kept at it and, and, and luckily I didn't break, uh, you know, um, so the business, you know, we turned the corner and, and, and did yeah. stuff like that. To answer your question, exactly what I do is that I draw frameworks. I give them systems. First of all, then I give them a vision of the future. Mm. If you ask any big CEO, any major athlete in the world, and you know that without having a vision, if you cannot future pace yourself and you understand where you want to be, it's impossible to get there. Okay. And that's why the power of visualization is so, so important. Like mm. uh, it's become mainstream today. Like people talk about meditation and visualization, which I do a lot mm. and having a vision board. In fact, last week I just updated my vision board. I want new things in life. Mm. You know, so powerful is the vision board. It's unbelievable. I'll give you an example. Maybe seven, eight years ago, I saw a, a um, advertisement in the newspaper, local newspaper. Mm. They were advertising the latest Maserati. Okay. Right. Uh, champagne, silver, uh, champagne gold, beautiful, beautiful car. Yeah. I cut it out. And then um, my, my son at that time was one year. He was, he was just turned one. So I basically cut that out, put it beside him, took a photo. It's even on my Facebook. I said, wow, you know, one day, one day. I just said one day. Yeah. Had it, had it uh, pinned somewhere in my, I, was, I think it was on my fridge. Mm. 2016, I'll remember 2016, February, I actually bought a Maserati. Really? Wow. Right. The power so, of the mind. Exactly. Yeah. You, you become what you focus on. Right? Wow. So because I was looking at it day and, and subconsciously, whatever my actions was doing, because at that time, it seems impossible. At that time, when I cut out that art, that advertisement, it was impossible I would get anywhere close even to the showroom. <laughs> <laughs> right? Wow, wow. I didn't have money, money to get to the showroom. Yeah. Let alone sit in one and buy one, right? And, and, and I don't know if you know, cars are extremely expensive in Singapore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's one of the most expensive, I think in the world, cars are the most expensive. So for me to be able to do that is the power of visualization. So I, I you know, I make the mistake too. Some, once in a while, I, I, you know, I, I get off it, but I realize that how powerful these things can be when you focus on something that you want. A lot of the times, what happens is that people focus on the things that they don't want. Yeah. Right. Right. I don't want this. I don't want that. I don't want this to happen. Yeah. So what ends what ends up happening is the thing that you don't want because you focused on doing it. Is that exactly consciously? There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scientific tests done yeah. on this matter. I mean, I'm 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 not reinventing the wheel or telling anyone listening to your show um, something different. But I tell you, so that's one of the things that I actually fix in people's uh, business. Okay. Like, what is your vision? Like, what are you working for? Let's find out the why. Mm. Is it for your family, you, whatever? So once you fix that why, then we look at what, what offer do you have to take to the world? Like, what are you so good at that you're packaging to bring out to the world? Mm. Like, what are the, that's, what, that's one thing that you've been known for. Like, you're the go-to guy. Yeah. And then we look at the systems, the process, or can you, can you create an a IP, an intellectual property in your business? Mm. Like, uh, so I, I have a system that can unravel even you. I can un unravel your IP in, in less than 20 minutes. Really? In, in simple steps. Yeah, exactly. So again, I like I said, I didn't to get involved in that. I want to yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for, for example, I didn't, I didn't invent that. Okay. I'll take no credit to invent that, but I spent, I don't know, maybe um, 50, 60, $70,000 learning those things. Like I invested in myself. Like, I don't have a problem to buy an ebook for eight dollars, ten dollars, buy a course for a thousand dollars. I have no issues because I don't buy a Gucci shoe, I don't buy a bottle service in the bar. You know, yeah. I don't do all of that. I, I, you know, I once in a while I go, I have a drink, but I see my money being spelled um, well if I put myself in a self development program. If I'm learning something new, yeah. uh, I don't mind spending. Like I was like books. I'll buy hundreds of books so you can see just, just behind yeah. me. It's just part of my collection. I, I actually, what I do is that I, I give out books. Like when I feel that it's really good, I give it. In fact, I even mailed some of the books that I've read to my students around the world. I said, have a read, you know, go read this book, right? Yeah. So for me, I think it's, it's so important that you need to invest in yourself. Like don't be afraid to pull out the credit card and buy something online to buy an online course or a book. Mm. even if you're, if you're only going to pick up one thing. I'll tell you, I paid for a course, right? I paid for a course. Someone in the US uh, taught me a bit about digital marketing. 10,000 US, mm. right? My wife's like, oh, 10 grand. I said, listen, 
it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, yeah. right? Not, not necessarily that's something that I want to be spending, but mm. I picked up one thing there that turned my business. Wow. Is it worth it? Of course, right? Is, yeah. Right? And I always go back and refer stuff like that. So, so but when you look at someone like uh, somebody pitches, an e everything is a scam. Everybody thinks, oh, it's a scam. He's trying to scam me. Will it work? And, I mean, forget about it. You're not going to have a foolproof um, product anyway. Mm. Like, no one's got to teach you everything. Yeah, yeah, true. Right? Yeah. So you're wow. going to pick up one part here, you've got one part here, and then you fix, fix everything to like, together, like I said. Pick up the success clues, and then you fix it yourself. You, you think about what fits for you, because you're a u unique human being. You're not like somebody else. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's yeah. what people don't realize. Like, oh, it doesn't work for him. Doesn't work. It shouldn't work for me. I'm like, so, but, but you're not the same. Yeah. No, it's true. Yeah. You touched on um, the power of uh, visualization. Uh, and I believe in that, to be honest. I mean, I'm not a spiritual, spiritual uh, person in any shape, way, way, shape, or form. But in terms of visualization, I used to use it when I was playing football. So, me, I was a, I was a left winger. Um, so, I used to, I mean, I used to visualize taking on the fullback, putting crosses in, cutting inside, shooting, doing things like that. And invariably, what I used to visualize, maybe the night, before the game or a couple of days before the game, it used to come true. And once I did it once or twice, three or four times, I thought, well, oh, it must be working. And it was just a positive thing. I didn't spend a lot of time on it. I could be watching TV and maybe just subconsciously thinking about things I'd do in the game. And then the next day I'll do it. Um, so I'll just continue doing it. I only really started doing that probably the latter stages of my career. Um, one of the things I did early on was, um, I actually said it on air when I was, I think I was 17, nowhere near the first team at that point. And I said, I want to make my debut in the first team at 18. And I actually did it. This was in the Premier League. Mm. So that was kind of my first notion that, okay, maybe this, there's something in that kind of power of visualization. So I do relate to what you're saying. And many, many people have said it before. Um, so it, it must be true. But what I, wanna, what I want to also uh, qualify here is when you want to do something, when you want to do something, what tends to happen is that you like to say to someone, right? Like you, you want to say to someone. So here's a trick that I use as well. Like if I want to do something, I kind of tell myself that, okay, I want to do this, but I don't say it to anyone. Yeah. I do it, right? For 30 days, I do it. Then, um, um, then the next thing, I could maybe tell my wife, I said, uh, you know, um, she probably asked, oh, you've been doing this. I said, yeah, you know, I'm trying to change my ways, maybe try and change my habit. Mm. That's for a bit of accountability, right? Accountability. Yeah, but I've been already I've already been doing it, and she asked me. So she asked me, there, why are you doing this?" I didn't say it. She asked me, well, "Why are you doing this?" So I'm changing. So she knows that I'm serious about this. I'm making a change. Yeah. So she starts to take me seriously. Mm -hmm. Then after 30 days, when it comes to maybe 60 days, then you start announcing to people that I'm actually doing this, and then you have the credibility to back up that you're actually going for that change, mm -hmm. rather than just saying and then not doing anything about it. Because what will happen is that when you share an idea, people shoot it down. Hundred percent. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I've so, heard a lot of people say that as well. And over the years, I've been one to, I've got loads of ideas and whatever. And sometimes flippantly you say something, and then it's, it's kind of gone. People are then waiting gone. to do it, and then they say, "Well, you said you were going to do that, and you haven't done it." And I've not necessarily happened to me, but I've heard people say that in conversation with other people. So that's one thing I've I've learned as well. Maybe if you're just going to work on something, work on it in silence, and then when you've got a bit of accountability or something like proof in the pudding to show for it then you can say well yeah i've actually i'm doing this and here's something to show for it that's why a lot of people don't start things the fear that they'll be rejected from the you know um uh, I'll, I'll give you an example one of the coolest things projects that we did in my business we start, we set up an online radio station mm. right and 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 sold sold the I'll come to I'll come to that part the, the the climax. But I'll tell you how I came up with the idea. As usual, I get my best ideas in the toilet when I'm sitting on the throne. I get some that's that's me time. So yeah. I said, how cool will it be to launch my own radio station? Mm. Then I'm like, hmm, that's pretty cool. But how do I go about doing it? So I started incubating the idea. Say, if I because the English Premier League was huge, or it still is huge here. Mm. The TV rights sold for three hundred million over three years. Okay. Then I say, okay, that is a so what if I took the audio rights and actually sold it, packaged mm. it and sold it? So I came out, I put together a presentation, hit up the two big uh, telcos here in Singapore. The one that actually had the TV rights say, that's the door, get out. 
but the other one said, hmm, interesting. So we formulated the idea. I didn't say it to anyone. I didn't say it to anyone. I worked in the background until the point where it got to a place where we were ready to go. And I actually told my team, I said, we are they're like, oh, what are you doing? And like, actually end up selling the idea and doing a licensing deal for, for seven figures, like over a million dollars, a couple of million dollars, right? Um, so that actually taught me, and, and, and I'll be very honest, I didn't have a mic, I didn't have a studio, I didn't have a presenter, I didn't know how to run a station, I, nothing. Okay. And our idea on a PowerPoint, we did it. Uh, but that was also the power of visualization, the power yeah. of working in silence. Yeah. And then getting to a level where you actually can be accountable and tell the entire team or tell anyone behind besides you. Mm. And then when the channel was actually on, on cable, on TV, on the day launch, and I took a photo and I said, this is the most beautiful day because it was impossible to happen, people said. Impossible to happen. Mm. And when you make the impossible happen, then you know you say, okay, that's, that's, that's nice. You must have been buzzing when obviously you, you realized that your dream essentially had come true with regards to the radio station. You said like it materialized from nothing really. Uh, and then you took a picture of it for memorabilia, obviously. Um, but yeah, I mean, you must have been so excited to obviously to start that project. Yeah, I think, you know, um, when you're actually in it, you don't really feel it. You don't mm. really, you know, you, you're actually involved in the project. You keep going 100 miles an hour. You're doing other things. You don't, don't think about it. But the yeah. day that morning when I, I remember very clearly sitting there, we know that the channel is going to be on and I switch it on. Audio is coming out. You know, you see yeah. a break cut sports radio uh, on the thing. And I'm like, my wife's looking at me and she's going, not bad. That's not bad. Like, you, <laughs> you know, like you, you've done it. Like, she's like, I can't believe you actually done it. But yeah. Those are the things that, you know, those are the stories of entrepreneurship that I think is worth sharing. Uh, mm. Not because I'm great or I want to tell everyone listening in to say that, you know, look at me, you know, I'm such a cool business guy that I know everything. Yeah. No, that's not the point. The point is when you have an idea, how you incubate it, how you bring it to life, yeah. right? Working in silence, making sure that you're working hard making sure that you're actually taking that project one step at a time mm -hmm. to a point where it's ready to be shared to the world where instead of them shooting it down, they get behind you to push it up, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. very important. Like getting the right momentum behind the right ideas, things move. Yeah. Right? And I've also made the mistake of coming up with the idea of sh shooting my mouth a bit too early. And yeah. I still do things like that because you just get mm -hmm. excited. Yeah. But I remind myself, like, I remind myself the times where I actually worked in silence where is where I actually got the biggest success. Okay. Right? So, so these are the things, I suppose, worth sharing. And if any entrepreneurs are listening, you can, you know, pick up these clues. Like, do mm. something. Do it first in silence. Get, get it to a level where you feel that, you're, you know, you don't have to be perfect, right? That's the, mm. that's the beauty of this. Like, people yeah. wait for the right moment. I'll give you an idea. I'll give you an example, rather. So when I speak to people, um, uh, footballers and athletes about my program, I say, okay, no, the time is not right. Let me wait. I sound like, there's no such thing as the right time. Like, wow. Tell me what's the right time. Like, when is the right time to get married and when is the right time to die? It's like, there's no such <laughs> thing, right? <laughs> yeah, it's true. I, I mean, you make some good points there. Um, and I want to touch on that slightly later on because I'm looking for some advice with regards to my podcast as well. I mean, I'm only, what, six or seven weeks in. Um, but that's got its own story anyway. Um, but you mentioned earlier about the goal that kind of not defines your career, but what you're famous for. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, Sassy scored the winning goal for Singapore in the 1998 uh, AWF Championships. How did that make you feel? Uh, Danny, I tell you, that's uh, people talk about the goal, but I think that's more of a journey than just a goal. Right. I, I, I said this to you at the start of the show that uh, I wasn't the most talented player. Like, mm -hmm. I, knew, I, knew, I know who I am, right? I'm mm -hmm. very clear about my abilities and stuff like that. Like, even now, my son's nine years old. He juggles the ball 100 times. I could never do that. I can't still do that, <laughs> right? Uh, but but that, that's not what I'm meant to do. That's not my yeah. superpower, right? So I was always the kid that, that didn't have the ability. Because I was, I'm six foot four, even when I was playing in my little village team, they usually stick me in the goal because I had nowhere else to play. Like, okay, you go in goal, right? <laughs> yeah. Because you're the, big, you're the big one. Just get in goal. 
So I used to stand in goal and you know try and be use, as useful as possible. But what I realized that one thing I had was I wanted to do better. Like I just wanted to be better. Like I just wanted to be part of the group. I wanted to win. I wanted to be part of the elite. So I worked really hard at it. Like worked and worked and worked my socks off, right? So as like they say, you know, you make your own luck. And then if you work hard enough, success finds you. So step by step, I actually, you know, uh, climbed the ranks. And I'll tell you the amount of humiliation I got getting to where I got. It's sometimes I, when I think about it and I go, oh my God, how, why, why did I not quit then? Like it was yes. easier to quit, mm -hmm. right? I was playing for a team, a local team um, mm -hmm. and in those days, a semi-professional, right? Um, mm -hmm. Where I was, I was part of the team, you know, the coach and the teammates they always are, we don't know what you're doing here. Like, why are you here? Like, you don't belong here, right? Really? So, but, but that was just all motivation for me to do better and better. I was playing yeah. in the under-19s, uh, a youth league here. And one day, out of the blue, I got a call. Uh, well, they sent a letter to the club. And then the, the coach uh, called me up in training. He said, hey, here's a letter from the national selectors. They want you to go and um, attend, be part of the training squad for the Singapore B team. Apparently, they're going on a tournament and they, and they invited you. So there's another guy with this, almost the same name who was actually playing the same team, right? Okay. He was playing the first team. So yeah. they thought it was him, like, like it must be him, right? <laughs> so when they, when they try and uh, um, confirm that it was me, then they said, no, we want the big guy, the, the center back. We want him. So I went there. But Danny, I'll tell you this. I waited for that moment all my life. Why? Right. That, that was my one chance, right? Mm. I always knew that chance would come and I will have to grab it. Like, yeah. this, is, this is my ticket, right? This is the mm. ticket. Like, <laughs> if you don't jump on the bus, that's it. You're gone, right? So yeah. I went to that training. I went to that session. I played like my life depended on it, mm. right? I was yeah. physically ready. I was mentally ready. I played. They, they made me mark one of the top uh, strikers at that time. By okay. the end of the game, I had to let him out of my pocket. <laughs> right? Really? Because yeah, because that's what all I wanted to do. Like I, I was single minded, like this guy's going nowhere. Yeah. So we had a we had an English coach at that time, Barry Whitbread. You know, his son Zach Whitbread actually played in Liverpool and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh and Norwich, right? So he appreciated an old fashioned centre back like me. Mm. Because he's from the English game. He realized he knows that you know you, he needs somebody to to fight alongside him and stuff like that. So after the training he said, You've never played a, a senior game in your life before. I said, No, I just so he said, well, you're part of my team, mm. right? So I made the team. Uh, and those days, if you make the national team, they'll give you a suit and, and, and you're going to make your suit and stuff like that. Yeah. Went to the tournament, went to the tournament, marked the best striker in Southeast Asia at the time, put him in my pocket again. 70 minutes, he, he was out of the game. They substituted him because yeah. I was single-minded. Like, if he's going to run, even if he has to run into the toilet, I'm going to follow him. <laughs> yeah. right? He was not good. Th these guys were going nowhere. No chance. Like, there's no way these strikers... I don't care how good they are. They're not going to outrun me. Right? Yeah. That, was, that was my single-mindedness. So I made the team, made the national team. So my rise to the national team happened in three years. Like the, like I, nobody, there are guys that actually gone through the different age group levels and stuff like that. Yeah. Make the apex. Okay? I made it in three. Wow. Right? And then I obviously had to wait for my turn. Um, there were other good players in the national team. So eventually when the AFF Tiger Cup came along, a lot of the senior players would, we had a bad, we didn't have a really good team. Mm. So these guys didn't want to go there and get hammered. So a lot of the, lot, not all, but quite a few of them said, okay, we are injured. We want to pull out. So Barry, Barry had the opportunity to bring his squad. We have already been working with him for the, with the pre-Olympic uh, Singapore B team. Yeah. So 80% of the young boys, young lads, he, he allowed us to now transition with him and go into the tournament. Why? I think we were destined to win the tournament. And, and, the, and the, like I said, you know, that goal that I scored, if someone stopped, paused, and then rewind my, white, uh, my life back like a flashback and think about all the stuff that I actually went through and how I got there, it's an mm -hmm. amazing story. And after I scored that goal and everything else in my life actually changed. Brilliant. That's an amazing story. And if, if I can take one thing from that, which I kind of already know anyway, is obviously when you're given an opportunity, you have to obviously seize it and you have to be prepared. And it seems like you were, and obviously it worked in your favor. Um, Sassy, we touched on retirement, and obviously uh, we touched on what you're doing now in terms of business and things like that. Um, did you get any help? Because obviously you're really successful, and going forward, I can just tell you're going to be even more successful. 
But did you get any help from the football world, um, family, people in business that you may have come across whilst playing football? Any organisations at all? Or was it all kind of learning the ropes as you went along? If I'm being completely honest, to, to get to, I said this a few times to my, my students, I've probably spent about close to $5 million of my own money to get where I am today. Mm. Cash. Wow. I've made that much mistakes and that many mistakes. Yeah. Um, and it's not a badge of honor that I wear, right? Uh, it's not that, you know, to, again, to share that how great I am or whatever. I made a lot of mistakes along the way. I wish I had someone who helped me along the way. I really wished I, one part of it was my own fault because I had this ego. Yeah. This ego that I can figure out things myself. Mm. Um, ego that I felt that I knew everything. So I got into business ventures had nothing to do with me. I didn't stay in my lane mm. and I got burned for it. Uh, ego that I felt that I knew everything and trusted the wrong people. I won't blame them. I blame me. Okay. Right. So, like I said, so I've spent that kind of money to get where I am today, roundabout. But I really, if I could go back in time, will I change things? No. Right? Mm -hmm. No. But I would possibly try and get a bit more help. I would probably get a mentor. Uh, and even mentor is a little bit of a uh, hyped up work because once you have a mentor, you don't have accountability of sorts, which is something that I work hard with my students to say, I'm, I'm not here to do the work. Yeah. I'm your co-pilot, you know, I'm here yeah. to, when you go off, off the, off the track, I'm, here, I'm really here to just pull back the levers to say, move back in this direction. So I, to answer your question, I, I had no help uh, whatsoever. I depended a lot on my gut instinct, which was wrong 90% of the time. Mm. Um, but along the way, I figured things out. I learned, I, I, you know, this gray hair here is all my, <laughs> <laughs> my battle wounds and stuff like that. Yeah, um, but like I said, I, I, I possibly, I mean, probably my, my journey was I, I learned the hard way. I really learned the hard way. I don't wish it upon anyone. Mm. I, I, I certainly don't want you to spend that kind of money or people listening in to spend that kind of money to learn what I've mm. learned um, over time, which has definitely made me wiser. So also, and that's one of the reasons why I started the whole mentorship program to kind, kind of short circuit my journey in yeah. the sense that I'm not going to do the work for you, but I can definitely give you the blueprint. I can definitely tell you how not to do it, okay. right? Uh, which is valuable. It's very valuable. And I can give you the frameworks to be successful. I can give you the mindset yeah. training to be successful. I can, I can pick up only the best things. You don't have to go and do the, the tough things. You don't have to have the heartaches that I've had, mm. like uh, having to face my wife after a failed business venture. <laughs> um, having to face myself in the morning, like, what, yeah. Whatever I just done, right? Um, yeah. So, but but Danny, I tell you what, it's a journey that um, you should never ever regret. No matter what happens in life, it's it's there for a reason. No matter how dark times are, there's always a reason why these things happen. You will yeah. never figure out when you are actually in it. Only on hindsight, you ah, oh, that's what you know. Ah, oh, yeah. no wonder that, that that must happen. So, I I would say that you know. Um, Fortune only, you know, favors the brave. Um, yeah. If you don't have risk appetite, you don't have the uh, appetite to take risk. Uh, and of course, when I say risk, it's different level of risk. If you're not willing to put yourself out there, if you're not willing to risk money, don't get into the entrepreneurship uh, game. Don't get into that game. Mm -hmm. Don't get into the game of business. Stay your nine to five job because this is not for the faint hearted. Yeah. I understand. It's not. Would you, would you say would you say more help needed for athletes when it comes to the time? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but to be honest, I mean, when I had my interaction with uh, the PFA, uh, maybe you also heard of uh, Osh, Osha, Osha Williams at uh, yeah. PFA. Yeah. Maybe you know Osh during a play, playing time. Yeah. I had a lot of interaction with them and I actually found out a lot more of what they actually do for the players. You guys definitely have a lot more help than we have in this part of the world. That's yeah. for sure. Mm. Um, and you should be grateful for that because this part of the world, I've actually been a consultant for the Asian Football Confederation and I've done my rounds with different federations uh, looking at uh, second careers for players. I've gone and done seminars and stuff. I, mm. I tell you what, you guys are miles ahead of, of what's happening in this part of the world. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure a lot more needs to be done. There's always room for improvement. I, I understand. Uh, but 
I think um, um, maybe what is probably needed, maybe from just a purely a UK perspective, um, is that maybe they should be looking at giving you guys a bit more practical skills earlier in life. Yeah. Um, and then maybe making that mandatory. Um, maybe not for the Premier League games, uh, Premier League players, because you, you, you do make that money. And, mm. and even then, only 10% earn that mega money, right? Exactly, yeah. I mean, I said it in a previous podcast before, um, maybe as part of the apprenticeship or that interim before you make it into the first team. And even when you make it into the first team as a youngster, Maybe you need to go and work in, in an office or in some type of working environment maybe once a week just to give you that um, kind of different perspective on the working life, something that's more tangible because not everyone's suited to maybe doing a course and educating mm. themselves, reading books and things like that. I mean, me personally, although I am quite academic, if I was playing still and someone said, right, um, you're going to have to maybe go in once a week to whatever organisation that you feel comfortable going into, um, I'd probably take that opportunity, even if it mm. didn't mean that I was willing to or wanted to go into that when I retire. It gives me a different perspective in terms of dealing with people I've never met before, uh, giving them uh, a sense of maybe a different perspective on how footballers are. Because everyone's got a perception of footballers and sports people in general. And just seeing things from the other side, if that makes sense, and maybe speaking to clients by email and over the phone, it just gives you something that can kind of take your mind off football um, and maybe even aid you going forward because if you have that experience and you think this ain't for me it may make you want to make it um, as a professional footballer even more or whatever sport you're in um, I personally think that's a good idea but how kind of feasible that is I don't know um, I mean the PFA do take a lot of stick but they do a great job and it's not easy what they're doing um, no, it's not, right? I mean, it's, uh, you can never satisfy everyone. But I'll tell you, I'll give you another example. My boys are nine and seven and yeah. they're aspiring footballers. They are, they're quite decent for at the level they play. Yeah. They want to pursue a career in football. Um, so what I've done is, I mean, they're, they're quite good in school. But yeah. I feel that I should actually give them the ability to think about how they can actually make money, right? Alternative um, careers, yeah. right? So I've, during this pandemic, I actually got them to start their own business, mm, right? yeah. uh, uh, how to be entrepreneurs and stuff like that. So yeah. what I'm actually doing is they're cultivating the habit of being an entrepreneur from a young age, take risks, do something. Because yeah. what can happen is that if they actually pursue the dream of being a footballer and it doesn't happen, and if they don't really necessarily have that education, but what they will have is they will have the ability to now fend for themselves. They can now actually start a business, no yeah. launch a business and get it to the next level, right? Yeah. And hopefully for the period that I'm around on this earth, I can actually guide them along. Yeah, cool. So I, I think that's, that's so important that athletes, not everyone is going to be academic. Let's be honest about that. Yeah. Right? That's what the re- one of the reasons why you play sport <laughs> because you're not really that good. But forcing them to say that this is the route to take, I think it's, uh, it's, um, it's not fair. And I think we seriously should be looking at how to allow those athletes. In, the, in America, they do a great job with this, right? They teach mm-hmm. how people, you know, they have all sorts of program with the entrepreneurship and stuff like that. And that's the reason, and that's ability, that's ecosystem where you, if you actually reach a level, the, your team around you helps you put your money into the right places and take you to the next level. We've seen that with the basketball players and in, in the yeah. NFL and all that. Uh, but when, once you get that to the apex, but I think we can even do that at the at the grassroots level. We can actually do it at different levels, and that's one of the things that I'm trying to do with my program, sports business mentorship. To say, yeah. if you're a sports coach, I'll give you the blueprint to start a business in seven days. No bullshit. Uh, mm-hmm. Seven days you'll be able to start, and in two or three weeks you'll have your first paying customers. If you don't, I'll give you back the money. So this is a promise I make. Yeah. Um, so I have a framework, tried and tested. I have a guy. Uh, that was in Belgium, running the Belgian soccer school. His name is Hans Beekman. Um, he was setting up a, a new school, brand new, in, in another city out, outside of uh, where he was in, from Brussels. First weekend, 47 kids using one, one of my strategies I taught him. And he put 70,000 euros into his business for the wow. year. Jeez. Right? So just one of them. So like, like I said, again, it's not a magic pill. You got to do the work. Yeah. But there are frameworks for such things. And that's, that's how I've now become a bit more focused on my, my program. Yeah. Purely for sports coaches, it doesn't matter if you're a football coach, basketball coach, the, the theory is the same. How do you attract and then uh, you know, identify, attract and convert 
okay. paying client. Those theories are universal. Uh, you, the theories are the same. So I have the framework, like I said, I can help uh, unpack your own IP because mm. if you are a, actually I'm working with a, with, with a guy that has got a coaching school up in Manchester. Uh, I said, what's the difference between you and a coaching school next door? What's the difference? Like if you don't create your own IP, if you don't create your own intellectual property, you're just another guy. How do you put, put a perfect offer together? I'm not talking a service offer. How do you pad different things up and say that if the guy is charging a hundred pounds, and you are charging 100 pounds, but you're giving more value, yours is an offer as opposed to a service. Yeah. Right? Who's gonna win? Like, once you do things like that, like once you get your mind right, reverse engineer the numbers, make sure that you, you get the right offer in place, you get a framework in place, that's no competition. That's why I say it's a market of one, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. You play in a market of one, right? That's, there's no such thing as a competition if you know how to unlock these things, put this together, and, and that's, that's the essence of my business these days. So what I try and do is instead of going um, like wide, I'm really going deep into that. Okay. Like in deep, deep into, so looking at different aspects and how people can get success as soon. So one of the local sports academies here, uh, they want to license my program now because uh, I presented it to them. They said, well, we love this. We want to do something specific for fitness trainers because yeah. everybody's hurting now. Right, with this pandemic, yeah, cool. they can't. So I, I've even got a plan to how to make it uh, recession-proof using technology, um, using all of that stuff to say, uh, it's not the end of life. Let's look at things differently. Yeah, it's about adapting, isn't it? Um, yeah. I mean, especially in these times where people are kind of un un unsure about where their jobs going to, well, in terms of job security, finance, financially, and various different things, people are kind of um, just in a place now where they're seeing things from a different perspective and certain things that they may have thought were kind of important may not be so important anymore. Um, and like I said, for me, I used the lockdown in a positive way. I started my podcast. Um, I probably wouldn't have done that if, if we weren't in a situation like uh, the lockdown. So for me, I just wanted to be able to portray the same message um, as in athletes have transferable skills um, and whatever else that comes with that. Um, so I don't want... Um, I don't want the retirement situation to be seen as a negative, which sometimes does happen within sport. Um, use it as a positive. Um, so I've done that, and I'm going to continue to do it just because I enjoy it. And I, I really do believe in the message. Um, one thing that I want to ask you about, obviously, so I've only just really started using Instagram, and obviously the podcast is, what, seven weeks in or something. So I've only got a very, very small following. But I know that the message I'm trying to portray is really important. Just because recently speaking to a lot of athletes and they're struggling when it comes to uh, or concerned when it comes to retiring um, and what to do afterwards and how they're going to be perceived and their identity and uh, finances, finances and whatever else. Um, so how can I how can I like increase my following? Uh, I'm not really bothered about kind of having loads of followers on Instagram and it looks great from an aesthetic point of view. I'm not concerned about that. Um, but it, I know it does help because when I'm speaking to people or when I'm asking them to come on the show, sending them an email via LinkedIn or whatever it may be or a message on Instagram, I think the first thing, in my head, I'm thinking the first thing people are going to do, especially if they don't know me, is look at how many followers I've got. And if I've got a small following, which I have, they're probably going to think, well, this isn't very good and he's, and he's not a high-profile athlete or a former athlete. So do you reckon, is that just me being overthinking things or do you think that kind of rings true to a certain degree? Um, yes and I know I will answer that question. I'm just, I'm just looking at your Instagram page. A <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um, couple of things of obviously you can do to optimize. I'm, I'm saying this as not as an Instagram expert. I, yeah. I don't like this idea of being an Instagram influencer or whatever. Yeah. I'm a big believer of something called the minimum viable audience. Okay. Uh, there is a marketing guru He's out of in the U.S. Maybe you might have heard of his name called Seth Godin. Like uh, search, search for him, right? Mm -hmm. I follow his because he's one of the greatest marketing minds. Just not marketing minds. He just looks at life and things very differently. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he talks about a tribe. A tribe uh, that trust you, believe you, yeah. and they want what you put out, right? So there is this common, common notion in life, in business and everything that you've got to have millions of people to buy from you. Listen to yeah. your podcasts love you and that's the only way you're going to be successful 
I, I, I call that BS because what you need, what you need is 100, 200, 300, even 500 to 1,000 people that absolutely adore you. Yeah. Can't wait for your next episode to drop. Yeah. Sending you text messages to say, hey, because don't get sucked into this world of fandom. Don't get yeah. sucked into this world of Instagram um, more, 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 um, people and all of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. The social media platform is there to do it, its job. Yeah. Like, don't get, don't, don't, don't get uh, sucked into the game. Like, use wow. it, but don't get sucked in. Yeah. I had a very interesting, very interesting conversation in the UK last year. I was there, I was at a bar having a drink and the guy next to me was constantly checking his Instagram, like constant Snapchat, this, and then he's like, oh, this guy's going here. And this. so I'm like, man, you know, you gotta, that's not the end of being, no, but because I need to be in the know, I need to know what's, to, I said, does your job require you to do that? No, he said, I'm a survey <laughs> and stuff like that. So I said, what, what is it? You're killing yourself for nothing. Like, yeah. because you are just giving your, your mind this dopamine hit, right? Mm. Right, because it needs it, so it feeds it, and then it becomes a habit. So coming back to your point, we can go on and on and on about that, but, but for you, look at the, being consistent is everything. Like, even yeah. I don't become consistent. Like, I tell myself, look at the platform that matters most to you. Like, mm. is Instagram the best place for you to be, for the stuff that you actually put out? Um, is it Twitter? Is it Facebook? Mm -hmm. Or is it LinkedIn? My yeah. biggest successes have come on LinkedIn. Okay. By far. Right. right? So if you, look at my, if you look at my Instagram page, I, had, uh, I used to have about 2,000 over people. Now it's dropped down to about 1,800. I'm yeah. active, not so active. Every now and then I pop something up there. But my Facebook group is growing. Like I've got thousands of people that want to grow. On my, and I, and I, because for me, Facebook, my personal page is quite personal. I only let in people that I trust and know. Mm -hmm. I'm active on Twitter. I had about 11,000 over people following me. Now I have about 4,000. It doesn't matter. But mm -hmm. on LinkedIn, I've got uh, cl closing in on about 8,000 people following me. Okay. Right? But meaningful connections. Yeah. Meaningful connections. Like I, I, I have some of heavy hitters on my, on my LinkedIn. Serious heavy hitters. Huge VCs, huge celebrities. You, all of these guys are on my platform. And I don't spam them. I don't put things that don't matter. Because once you put... so, Which is what's called optimizing your social media page. Yeah. Right? So I, I, I want to give you an example. Uh, since while we're on this topic, I'll give you a quick example and then you can, you can, you can look at it. If you go mm -hmm. onto my Twitter page, if you go onto my Twitter handle and if you look at uh, my... Uh, where is it? Yeah. I hope you can see. Yeah. Uh, so my, my banner page, it basically image of me there on the right-hand column says, former athlete, entrepreneur, angel investor, sports radio host, motivation speaker, and mentor. Mm -hmm. And I have a quote there. It says, the difference between who you are and who you want to be is what you do. Okay. Right? And then I have a brief description of what I do. Um, so when, some, when you add someone, what's the first thing, human instinct, that somebody's going to do? They're going to check you out. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if you don't have a, have a really good uh, uh, um, shot of you, if you're not optimized it properly, what are the chances they will accept you? Yeah, probably uh, slim. Very slim. Yeah. But if you, look, if you make yourself look important, yeah. if, you, if, you, if you're authentic about your tweets, you're not offensive, you have a good uh, 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 photo, means to say that you have taken pride in how you look, yeah. how you optimize the page, one look, they know who you are, Right, uh, it's the same thing. If you go to my my LinkedIn page, it's the same. So I try and focus on the platforms that gives me. I'm not on social media to be popular. I'm not. Same here, yeah. That's not my game, right? Uh, I don't need to be popular. I've got my own radio show, and I don't need. I don't need yeah. it. But I'm trying to 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 bring business. My radio show. I got my radio show because I was active on Instagram. Why? Okay. I added value there. The chief editor of the station saw what I was doing, liked what I do, um, called me up for a meeting. I closed that deal there. Uh, I sponsorship for my shows. Also, I closed the deal there. Connection for other things. Everything I've done, LinkedIn by far for me is the most successful. So I go all in on that. Okay. Right. So you need to basically find that space that it's it's gonna work for you. Right. Don't try to be. Instagram famous, Facebook famous, and LinkedIn because you won't have the time and you won't have the energy to be there. Yeah, that's and most importantly, 
Yeah. Most importantly, what's your ROI on it? What's your ROI on it? What's your return on investment of your time for it? Yeah. So when you're not in the game to be famous, you think about it from a very um, return-driven way. Well, that's true. I mean, the reason, aside from obviously the main reason of the podcast, which is athletes do have transferable skills, transitioning from sport, that's the two kind of um, avenues that I, I focus on, um, hence why you're on the show. Um, but at the same time, um, I'm not I'm not interested in kind of like you said, insta famous and things like that. That doesn't really interest me. As long as I've got a core bunch of listeners, as long as I can touch one person, if they see one of my shows and they think, oh, actually, well, I can relate to that because that person played football or that person used to be a swimmer. I I'm in that field at the moment, and I was concerned about what I'm going to do when I finish playing. If that person can do it, then I can. That's what I want. That's my message going forward to. To my listeners um and yeah i'm only i'm in my infancy at the moment with, with regards to the podcast it doesn't cost me anything i really enjoy yeah. it so the time i'm speaking to you isn't time lost if anything i've, I've gained knowledge and i've also um provided a service to my listeners as well so if i'm not you know what what, 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 what you're doing what what you're doing is amazing like Thank you're you. actually learning from learning for people like me and all the other guys that have been on your podcast. You're yeah. actually getting life lessons interviewing them. Exactly. Like, how amazing is that? Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, so, with, with me, because I'm always constantly thinking about my podcast in a positive way. So for me, that means that it must be right. And when I speak to people, I know for a fact the message is right. Um, what I initially wanted to do prior to the lockdown was um, go into football clubs and speak to uh, players of whatever age and explain my story and explain the same thing that I'm doing in the podcast. But logistically, it probably wouldn't work for me because I've got a nine yeah. to five job. So I wouldn't be able to commit to that. So I, I, even though I went in and had a couple of meetings with the football team and they seemed quite receptive, in the end, there was always something playing in the back of my mind and that was it, logistics. And then maybe if I've been to one club once, how would I then go back and tell something else? There was no continuity. Then the lockdown happened and I thought, well, I'm still passionate about this message because I don't think many people are aware of transferable skills. And if they are, how do they sell themselves in an interview and whatever else? Um, so I thought, well, how can I start something that's little or no cost to me that gets that message across and reaches the masses in, in inverted commas? And this is it. It doesn't cost me anything. I'm in my own room. Um, I haven't got an office. I haven't got a microphone or anything. If that happens later, brilliant. But I'm not thinking about that. In the, in the micro, in the macro, fine. Um, but I want this message to get out there. So I think it's working at the moment. I'm going to continue doing it. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of transferable skills for yourself, what did you use from sport to get you to where you are now? I think football teaches you a lot. Like my business, I haven't had any formal education on, on business at all, zero. The only yeah. formal education I got was football. So when we dissect football, it talks about team dynamics, performance, talks about commitment, discipline. Okay. It talks about performance, high performance. Mm. I, I always say that football, uh, and you, you know this well as well, we are judged in 90 minutes. Yeah. Sometimes twice, three times a week. Mm. Not just you, not just your team, public. You know, yeah. if you, if you, you know, nationwide, sometimes if you play international football globally. So, yeah you know how to operate under a very um, un high pressure environment mm. to play as a team, be an individual when you need to, take instructions, bark out when you have to, yeah. handle the pressure of people screaming at you. Yeah. You know, we, we talk about all these uh, causes coming out now about racism and stuff like that. People had to put, put up with this for a long time. Yeah. Right? You know? So think about all of that and then you transfer that to a nine to five job or business. Yeah. You have time. You have, have time to be successful. You know, you know, people give you time in business, like month, two months, three months, six months, a year sometimes to perform. Yeah. I mean, that's nothing compared to football. Like zero, that's, you can't even compare. But yet <laughs> people fail. Yeah. yeah right? So when you, talk, when you talk about transfer skills, you take that simple, same mindset and then don't lose it, yeah. be as competitive as possible, and then take it to this side. There's no chance. There's a reason why some of the most successful businesses in the world like to hire athletes. Mm. 
I, for one, if an athlete came to my, my, my office and said he wants a job, in 10 seconds, I'll hire him. Okay. <laughs> because he might not have the skill sets, but I'll tell you what he has. Team play, high performance, willingness to learn, adapt, move, yeah. and, 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 and follow, right? So I've, I'm, I'm one of those guys that you know here in Singapore that I've, you know, any athlete reach out, reaches out to me, I try my best to hire them. Uh, in fact, I've, 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 over, over the last 13 years, we've cr created some of the top executives in different, uh, different roles around the, around the world. The, the guy that leads the La Liga, La Liga office here for Asia used to be my staff, right? Oh, wow. Some executives there. So, so again, we've created people in the industry because purely because we put them in the, in the front line. I trust them. Yeah. Like, I know he's, these guys are athletes. They, they don't play to lose. They don't yeah. play to draw. They're only playing to win. Like, you can't teach yeah. that. Like, you can't teach that. No, that's true. That's you instinct, I mean? right? Yeah. You've, you've got to be that's instinct. what you're doing. Because obviously, you're, you're, you've got a massive platform. And obviously, you're doing, you've got a lot of fingers in a lot of pies. And you're, it sounds like you're successful in all of them. But you're also willing to employ an athlete who, like you said, has got all those kind of traits that you bring as an athlete, uh, but has no skill in your kind of service that you're offering to your customers. But you can always learn that, and it seems like that's what you're kind of diving into, and that's invaluable. Because if I was a player over there now, um, and I was in that situation where, okay, I'm at a crossroads, where do I go from here? The first person I'd contact would be you, especially <laughs> hearing what you've just said there, because the opportunity there, footballers, people in general, that, that normally they're willing to learn, and as long as someone's willing to learn, you can generally work with them and you can kind of mold them into what, what you uh, want them to be going forward. Um, so you've got to it, be... It, it, that, it, that it, won't be, it won't be it won't, it won't be easy, Danny. I'll tell you, uh, the guys that actually work with me, they know I'm hard. I'm hard on them. Yeah. Right? But I'm, it's not personal. I just want you to be the best that you can be. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I, 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 mean, I want to bring up... You know, uh, it's not that I hate you or whatever. I, I just don't. In fact, it's actually the contrary. I like you. Yeah. I want you to succeed. And that's why I'm hard on you. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've come across many football managers who've managed me um, and they've got a similar um, kind of outlook on how they manage. They're hard, but they're fair. And normally the ones that they're hard on, they can see that they can get more out of them. Um, mm. in terms of ability it's all there they just maybe need pushing in a different direction um, in terms of kind of input um, but yeah I mean in terms of your businesses just let us know uh, again what they are their names where they can be found and just touch on what you do again right so my 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 agency which is a, a consultancy these days that what we do for uh, sports associations uh, brands and sponsors it's called Reka Global so mm -hmm. rekaglobal.com is the uh, agency um, website. Uh, that's, that's what I do. And of course, my mentorship program is called Sports Business Mentor. So if you uh, go on the website, sportsbusinessmentor.com, um, there'll be information there. You can opt in for my three steps uh, sports coaching business formula. You can follow me on my Instagram, uh, my Twitter, and of course, my LinkedIn, where I put out a lot of content, mm -hmm. uh, my YouTube free content just for you to learn what yeah. you're doing. And then if you want to work with me, uh, there are different programs. There's a membership for as little as $47 a month. Uh, you join the membership. I still give great value there. Or you can join me for my one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentorship, which is uh, tailor-made. You know, you're dealing with me. You have my time once a week. Uh, obviously, that's going to you know, be a bit of an investment, but, uh, but it, it, you, you're learning from someone who has got almost 15 years, been in the trenches, like I said, almost $5 million, uh, spent to learn to get where I am. So you get first-hand information. Uh, to, to, to bring your business to the next level fairly quickly. Uh, so these are two of my main, um, I would say, uh, stuff that I do. I've got my uh, radio show on the weekend, which is, which is called Sports Talk Saturday and Sunday on uh, Channel News Asia. Uh, if, well, if you're in the UK, you can listen it uh, via, of course, internet radio. Uh, but on, on Monday nights, what I do is that I uh, interview ex-Premier League players. It's called Sports Stories with Sassy. If you go on uh, Facebook, you can actually find it. Mm -hmm. um, I've had some really interesting people on my show uh, talking about their life. I, I try to extract the, the essence of who they are on that show. Okay. So different ways you can find you definitely, if you, if you, if you type in my name, R. Sasi Kuma, you, I, th I suppose there's in, enough content out in the internet that you stumble upon me. Follow me. I think, uh, like I said, uh, I try and 
add as much value as possible. I'm very driven. Few things I'm really passionate about: family. So yeah. dealing with kids, how to bring up kids and stuff like that. I'm sharing stuff all the time. Yeah. Um, entrepreneurship. That's definitely one of the stuff and self development. So if I find something that can I, I can improve myself, I share it openly. Yeah. Uh, so that because in a world where there's so much negativity, I want to be the guy that brings positive vibes. Mm. Brilliant. Um, thanks for that. I mean, Sassy, I've really enjoyed your time today. I uh, picked up a lot of good points, and I'm sure the listeners have too. Uh, keep in touch going forward. Keep doing what you're doing as well. Uh, really inspiring. Um, and once again, like I said, thanks for thanks for coming on. So I know you're a really busy guy. No, thank you for having me. Really enjoyed. I always enjoy sharing my journey with anyone. So, you know, it doesn't matter if you've got uh, 10 followers or a million followers. It doesn't matter yeah. to me. As long as we change one person's life or two person's life with the work we do here or a chat, I think we have all done our part to make uh, the world a better place. Brilliant. Appreciate your time today, Sassy. Good luck and thank you. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.